A quick note to those who aren't Lithuanian speakers. Today's guest, Dr. Lima Vince, will deliver her presentation in English. My introductory remarks that follow will be in Lithuanian. Šiandien prelegente e mus prabils apie jos anksčiau šiais metais išleista akademinę monografiją Vanished Lands. Laima Vincė Stroginis įgyjo humanitarinių mokslų daktoro laipsnį Vilniaus universitete, rašymo literatūros magistro laipsnį Kolumbija universitete, negrožinės literatūros magistro laipsnį New Hampshire universitete, bei anglų ir vokiečių literatūros bakalaura Rutgers universitete. Laima Vincė yra gavusi dvi Fulbright kūrybinio rašymo stipendijas, National Endowment for the Arts Premier bei Pen Vertimu Fondo Dotacija. Ji rašo anglų ir lietuvių kalbomis, yra išleidusi per 30 knygų negrožinės bei grožinės literatūros, poezijos ir literatūros vertimo žanruose. 2025 metais Peter Lang International Publishers, ta pati leidikla, kuri išleido Vanished Lands, Išleis dar vieną jos knygą, Heritage, Connection, Writing, Conversations with North American Lithuanian Diaspora Writers. Šiuo metu ji yra po doktorantūros tyrėja Vytautojo Didžio Universitete Kaune. Laimo Vincė kalbės apie 30 minučių. Po to maždaug 40 minučių paskirsime klausimams ir atsakymams. Kviečiu per chat funkciją paskaitos metu, ar iškart po jos klausimus man rašyti asmeniškai. Savo ruoštu tinkamų laiku jos perskaitysiu garsiai. Everyone will have an opportunity to pose questions in Lithuanian or English to our speaker during and immediately following her presentation. Please use the chat function to do so and address your questions to me. I will read them at the appropriate time. O dabar fėčiu laimą. Labą vakarą visiems. Labai ačiū jums, Viktorai, už tokią labai išsamų įvadą. And now I will switch to English. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And... I will be talking about my academic monograph, uh, Vanished Lands, Memory and Post-Memory in North American Lithuanian Diaspora Literature. Um, the book is over 500 pages long and there's a lot to talk about. And um, But this evening, I'm really going to do my best to condense that talk into half an hour and really touch upon the main themes of the book and then open up um, the forum for discussion. And I really do invite you to ask questions and um, and really share your your thoughts. So if I may have the um, the slides, please, um, and we'll go to the first the, the first slide. Okay, we'll go to the the next slide. Thank you. All right, so um, my life has been a process of searching for identity, okay, attempting to understand from the distance of time and geography, a cultural memory inheritance that has been passed down to me through the echoes of Lithuania's collective historical trauma. Vanished Lands is the result of years of research and thinking about these topics. It is a book inspired by a lifetime of listening to survivor stories. So I'd really like to start by talking about why, um, why I wrote this book and why Vanished Lands. Um, for me, Vanished Lands was really typifies the experience that many of us um, who grew up in the United States and Canada during the Cold War years um, experience, which is that literally our country, Lithuania, had vanished off the map. It was really, it was no longer um, part of the map of the world. It was only included as part of the Soviet Union. 
And there were many countries that had vanished off the map um, after World War II, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, the list goes on. And so um, having grown up in the diaspora community and participated in diaspora activities, um, for me, there was always that question of identity, um, who am I, where do I belong, what country do I belong to? Because the country that I was told that I came from had literally vanished from, from the map. And uh, so those were some of those ideas that I had been thinking about all my life. And then when I started reading um, memoirs and works of literary fiction by other North American writers of Lithuanian descent, I found that I was not the only one thinking about these topics and um, that other writers like Antana Shileka and Daiva Markalis, Yulia Shukis, and many others were thinking and writing about the same topics. Okay, so if we could take a look at the next slide. Dario? Yes, thank you. All right. So um, <clears throat> I was not the only writer thinking about um, the vanished lands. Um, so when I started doing research for my um, PhD dissertation at Vilnius University in 2016, the first thing I did was to start looking for North American writers of Lithuanian descent who were writing about um, Lithuania and in particular um, about Lithuanian history. And what I found were was very surprisingly that almost 100 works of literature have been written in English by North American writers of Lithuanian descent, and that these books have been published both by commercial publishers and independent publishers in the United States and Canada. And there's also many books that have been self-published. And you can find a bibliography of these titles in um, in Vanished Lands, but it keeps growing and growing. And so what I saw was that there was a real need um, to write about Lithuania, that writers who were born in Canada and in, and in America, in many different parts of America, and who had grown up and come of age in the United States and Canada, were um, writing about Lithuania, and in particular were writing about Lithuanian um, historical trauma topics. And um, so I found writers in Alaska, Chicago, Boston, New York, who were really preoccupied with the same subject. And it really got me thinking about why, why, you know, and some of these writers, it's the only subject that they have written about. So these works of literature are mostly about the cultural and historical trauma that has shaped Lithuania, ranging from events such as the 19th century efforts of the Tsar of Russia to rustify the Lithuanian people by banning the Lithuanian language. And here we, I would like to refer you to um, The Book Smuggler by Biruta Putrus, for example. Um, the first and second Soviet Russian occupations of Lithuania, 1940, 1941, and 1944 and 1991 and the Nazi occupation of Lithuania and the Holocaust that killed between 90 to 95% of Lithuania's Jewish population. And then of course, also the flight of displaced persons from Lithuania in 1944 and their existence in displaced persons camps in the allied territories of Western Europe. And then another topic that was um, important for these writers was the movement for Lithuania's independence in the late 80s and early 1990s. So if we could have the next slide, please. Okay. Ah, yeah, I just wanted to quickly have you take a look um, at the memoirs that I wrote about in Vanished Lands. And so Vanished Lands really grew out of my um, doctoral dissertation, but it's much bigger and much deeper book than my doctoral dissertation. And so I found, um, actually, the new book that I have coming out this year, which is called Heritage Connection Writing, and it consists of 25 conversations with North American writers of Lithuanian and Litvak descent. That's 25 writers. I had to take out 10 just because the book was too big. And um, 
really what inspired that book was that there were so many writers, wonderful, wonderful writers whose work I studied and I just, you know, had to really narrow it down to um, the seven that I write about extensively in Vanished Lands. Um, I also had to work, choose a genre to work with. Um, I wanted to work with all the genres at first, but I really had to stick with um, memoir in the end. So there's, so I really, what I did was I was looking for um, writers from the three different generations, which would be called the post-memory generation. So the first generation um, are people who directly themselves experienced historical trauma. So representing this generation, I have Samuel Bach, whose incredible memoir, Painted in Words, was published by Indiana University Press in 2001. And then Algirdas Landsbergis and his post-war play, um, Five Posts in the Market Square. All right. And then I looked at um, Ellen Cassidy, We Are Here, Memories of the Lithuanian Holocaust, which is a right of return novel. She's actually a third generation um, American writer with Litvak roots and um, second generation writers such as Daiva Margalis, White Field, Black Sheep, Rita Gabis, A Guest at the Shooter's Banquet, Antana Sheleka, The Barefoot Bingo Caller, Yulia Shikis, Siberian Exile, Blood War, and a Granddaughter's Reckoning. Okay, next slide, please, Dado. Oh, could I have the next? Okay, here we go. Okay, all right. So post-memory, what is the difference between memory and post-memory, between a memoir and a work of post-memory? And then, of course, we could also talk about life writing, which is yet... Um, well, let's go back one. Yeah, let's stay here for a minute. Okay, so um, memoir, life writing, post-memory writing, these are types of writing that are very, very popular in our, in our present moment. And so I'm going to talk, go some, some into those terms in de into depth, but basically memoir, for example, Samuel Bach, he writes a memoir about his childhood living through the Holocaust in Vilnius. Um, but then he also, part of his memoir is post-memory because he reimagines the lives of his relatives who were killed in the Holocaust when he was a small child. So he only knew them from the stories that his mother told him. So for me, post-memory as a memory catalyst has to do with my grandparents, who you see in the photograph here, so in 1936, my grandparents, Anitzeta Simutis, Yanina Simutiene, traveled by ocean steamer to New York City. They were 18 and 26 years old. My grandfather was a young diplomat, just starting his career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, because he had learned English, he was posted to the Consulate General in New York. And originally that posting was for three years. They were eager to return to Kolnas. Um, but two things happened in 1939, in the autumn of 1939. In September 1939, Hitler and Stalin invaded Poland. And in November 1939, my mother was born in New York. So they could not go back. Um, my grandfather became a, um, a diplomat in exile working for Los Araitis, And uh, they could not return until 1991. But for me... My grandparents really were the people who passed on my understanding of um, Lithuania before World War II and also of the tremendous loss um, that Lithuanians experienced through the occupation of Lithuania. All right, so next slide, please. Okay, so here, this photograph shows my grandmother who is um, the young woman on, I guess it would be my far left. Oh, it's <laughs> hard. Okay, so there's a, she's a younger woman um, at the far end of the photograph. And um, she was working for, as a social worker, for an organization called the American Federation of International Institutes and her co-worker is the man in the hat whose name was um, Werner Wartenberg. 
He was a German Jew who had lost his entire family in the Holocaust. And uh, they worked as a team. They were also very good friends. Werner Württemberg was a close family friend. Um, and they worked helping to greeting the boats, bringing over refugees and displaced persons into New York and helping to settle them in homes and help them find jobs and settle into an American life. So my grandparents were very much involved through their work. My, my grandmother is a social worker and my, my grandfather um, working in the consulate, helping um, resettle, resettle refugees. Okay, next slide, please. All right, I'd like to talk about the terminology that's important in this book because the term, understanding the terminology really helps to um, unlock the themes of the book. So post-memory was first developed by Marianne Hirsch to describe the preoccupation of the second and third generations born to Holocaust survivors with the historical trauma and collective memory of their parents and grandparents. Um, when the uh, graphic novel Mouse was published, which is a bestseller, I'm sure you all know it, she was really um, very amazed that here was this detailed, highly emotional book. It tells the story of um, a young couple surviving the Holocaust written and illustrated from the perspective of the son. And she started thinking about, for her generation, she was a child of Holocaust survivors from Romania, that so many um, Jewish friends of hers who had parents who had survived the Holocaust um, were preoccupied with writing about the Holocaust, write, um, drawing, creating art, um, creating music, and uh, so she came up with this term post-memory, which really means that um, where the previous generation has survived a collective historical trauma that is so powerful that the memories of that trauma literally, um, they, they kind of, they overshadow the memories of the second generation generation, or even, and sometimes even the third generation born to them. So the normal rites of passage in a person's life, such as graduating school, marriage, family, um, all of these exist, but there's always this underlying feeling that um, the collective trauma experienced by the previous generation is so much stronger. But Marianne Hirsch herself realized that um, with so many genocides, sadly, taking place on this earth and so many wars that post-memory could be applied um, to other groups beyond Holocaust survivors. And um, so I, I started thinking about how um, North in the North American Lithuanian diaspora, on so many levels, um, we were all experiencing a form of post-memory. Now, everybody processes traumatic events differently, so there's really no one-size-fits-all here. Um, but I started thinking about how many of our events of remembrance were actually post-memory events, and then reading through more than 100 books written by North American writers of Lithuanian heritage, I just kept seeing more and more and more post-memory in that work. Okay, so let's take a look at the next slide. Um, this is a quote from Antana Shileka's memoir, The Barefoot Bingo Caller. And he writes, this is an example of post-memory. The Canadian part of my life lay neglected. I had never been to Newfoundland or anywhere truly north. I once had fantasies of drinking my way through the Okanagan Valley or of searching out whatever commercial fishermen remain on the Great Lakes in order to ship out with them. These were oversights I might never remedy, fantasies I would never realize. Much as I would have liked to write about the place where I lived, I kept writing instead about the place where my parents came from. So this is very true where Shileka, being born and raised in Canada, 
has this moment um, of truth with himself where he realizes that he never wrote about being Canadian, that he was just continually returning to Lithuania and writing about stories that are connected with his parents' experience as um, DPs. So let's take a look at the next slide. All right, and here's an excerpt from Yulia Shukis's very powerful book, Siberian Exile. And uh, she writes, every family tells its children the story of who it is. Our story was of a proud people forced from their homeland when the soldiers came. They took my father's mother and shipped her east of the Ural Mountains alone. They took her by mistake. It was all a mistake, or so the story went. Her husband Anthony had been the target. He had escaped to the safety of the West by luck and through cunning with his children. Our job as kids was to learn this story and remember it, to master our grandparents' languages so that one day we might return home from exile. The first problem in taking on this latter task was that we had never seen this home to which we were to repatriate. The second was that the story we'd been told wasn't strictly true. Important pieces of it, the complicated bits that made it hard to narrate, had fallen away. So what Yulia sets out to write um, a, a, a book about her grandmother's life, about her grandmother's exile to Siberia. In fact, she actually travels to Siberia and, and, and visits the place where her grandmother spent many years of her life. But what she discovers when she starts working with the uh, special archives in Lithuania was that her grandfather was um, what you would call a, a desk murderer, a person who, um, as part of the Lithuanian police force, who signed off on the murders of Jewish people in Noyamistis. And uh, this comes as a, a, an enormous shock to her. And so really her book is uh, traces the story of her family, but also is a reflection on... Um, on inherited guilt, whether whether guilt for an ancestor's crimes are passed down in the family, and and how and how to live with these emotions. It's a very complicated book. All right, next slide, please. So here's a photograph of Yulia Shukis's grandmother in her place of exile. Uh, next slide. All right, so. Samuel Bach, in an interview with me in December 2019, he said, my memoir is closely related to my paintings. I did not write with the self-consciousness that the professional writer has. I decided to bring back to life something I, that I knew existed in my memory. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and this is one of um, Bach's most famous paintings, and really he has told me that this is one of the most important paintings that he ever did. This is not a literal representation of his family, of the many, many, many relatives. In fact, his entire extended family um, was killed in the Holocaust in the Vilnius region. Only he and his mother and one aunt and one cousin survived. But this is... Um, a reimagining through the stories and the lives of those family members, how he wanted to acknowledge and remember them. So this painting is very closely tied to his memoir because through his childhood memories, that he was nine when he was um, arrested and put into the Vilnius ghetto, um, he really only had these very childish memories of his family, but his mother told him stories. And so there is a post-memory aspect to his memoir where he tries to recreate the family that he has lost. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so here, these are also some photographs. These are memories. The, the photograph of the young men um, beside the um, barbed wire fence. This photograph was taken um, in the post-war years in Wiesbaden, in the displaced persons camp. And you see <clears throat> in that photograph, Jonas Marcus, his brother, Adolfus Marcus, and Algirdas Landsbergis, all as young men in their early 20s, you know, spending the time not living in limbo, discussing literature, writing poetry, not sure what was going to happen next. And then on the the top right, you see this group of men 
Um, these are Lithuanian men who ended up in Canada. Um, they had been, as, as young men, as teenagers, they had been taken by the Germans and sent to Germany to work as forced laborers, ended up in the DP camps after the war. And because they were young and single, emigrated to Canada but then had to spend several years um, working in public works projects really to pay off their ship passage and um, and to earn their, their right to be immigrants and citizens in Canada. And then the lower um, a corner, you see a photograph of Algirdas Landsbergis's family on the ship entering into New York Harbor. Okay, next, um, please. Next slide, please. So those are those are po those are actual memories in those black and white photographs, but they live on in our memories, second, third generation. They live on for us as post memory. And when you're a creative person, when you're an artist, when you're a writer, you have that 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 need to create to kind of to tell those stories. And so you go back into those actual memories and you create your post memory version do want to give a post-memory disclaimer that when analyzing emotional aspects of post-memory in a work of literature, it's important to recognize that post-memory is not the actual memory of the people who experienced historical trauma firsthand. So as such, post-memory, like firsthand memory, is subjective. Post-memory writers reimagine the experiences of previous generations within the context of a collective history. Post-memory often relies on emotional truths. Also, the conclusions a post-memory writer draws from historical trauma experiences may differ from the lived experiences of their ancestors. So it's really important to read post-memory carefully. Don't read post-memory as though you were reading um, a historical text. I mean, although, I mean, but it's kind of not fair to say that either because narrative, the narrative nonfiction work that I worked with for this book was carefully researched with, you know, really accurate and reliable sources. Um, but what happens with post-memory is that inevitably there are gaps in an ancestor's story. And that's where the writer um, employs the tools of fiction to create scenes in which the writer imagines what could have happened. What was it like? However, those scenes are based closely on research and history, but they're not um, archival research. And this is where um, post-memory writers and historians clash, all right? Um, because post-memory um, brings in the imagination and it brings in... Um, something that we borrow from the world of literature, which is the sense of the emotional truth. So the emotional truth is not the literal objective truth of what happens, but is how you emotionally experienced that event. Uh, we could talk about that some more in the discussion part, because that's, that's a little bit tricky to understand. Uh, all right, next slide, please. Okay. All right. So for example, when um, here's a quote from R Rita Gabis, a guest in the shooter's banquet, um, where she had never been to Lithuania before she started working <clears throat> on her book, but she had all these complicated emotions around Lithuania. And she writes, it's a prism. It belongs to anybody who wants it. It even belongs to people like me who for many years hated to pronounce its name not just because I had any special empirical knowledge of Lithuania. I had the lullabies my mother sang to me so I'd sleep and the stories that she told me that kept me from sleep, the ones about war, the ones about the potatoes that made her fat in the displaced persons camp. Okay, next slide. All right, and Yulia Shukis writes, not everyone lives this way so tethered to the past. What would a life untethered look like, I wonder? A life in which the only place I am from is the place I happen to be. Would it be a better place to live, less painful? Is it even possible to make such a choice? So these writers are raising questions about um, this sense of, are we ever free from our family's past? 
or is it possible? Is that past a burden or is it a gift? All right, next slide. All right, so I know I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, on, on uh, my watch here, so I'm going to wrap this up soon, but I wanted to bring up another important aspect of post-memory, which is right of return. And that's a term developed by Marianne Hirsch and others to describe the trauma-laden journeys of return in which the children and grandchildren of former refugees, concentration camp victims, <clears throat> exiles, visit the homelands of their parents and grandparents seeking answers about family narratives and identity. Now, I went on one of these right of return trips myself back to Lithuania as a young woman. So narrating and reflecting on the right of return journey has become an integral feature of the post-memory memoir since the collapse of the Soviet Union has made the vanished lands of Eastern European Europe accessible to Western travelers. So this Return actually, there is a right of return journey in every single the one one of the memoirs that I analyze in Vanished Lands, and I think that probably people listening tonight have had their own right of return experiences. A very powerful book about right of return is Irene Guilford's book The Embraced, which is um, autobiographical fiction about returning to Lithuania to meet lost family members. All right, next slide. Okay, so a few examples of the right of return. Here's a photograph of Samuel Bach in his studio in Paris as a young man, a young painter. <clears throat> and he says in Painted in Words, I did not travel to Vilnius to rekindle the memory of past horrors. These are and they must remain part of my being. What I feared was that this pain would block my access to new experience, but my fear proved ungrounded. Next slide. And Antana Shileka writes, so why this ongoing return to Lithuania, land of rolling green hills so similar to Southern Ontario? For one thing, the stories here in the old country were more brutal, the takes so much higher than back in Canada. Placed beside the gulag, suburban angst is pitiful. Okay, next slide. All right, so the last concept that I'm going to talk about well, before we transition into discussions is the concept of haunt memory, which was developed by Gabriel Schwab, Ross Chambers, and others. And it explains the sense of being haunted by violent memories from the past that were committed by one's predecessors. So the hauntings of the survivor and the perpetrator are recreated through narratives as a secondary trauma experience. Um, so this includes dreams, powers of the imagination as key features of haunt memory text. All right, so um, haunt memory appears in a literary text or post-memory text in a ghostly form. The concreteness of the event and its specific details is absent, but the haunting traumatic sense of the event remains. So next slide. So here's an example of haunt memory from Rita Gabas's, um, a guest at the Shooter's Banquet. Now her grandfather um, was chief of police in um, Schwenchonis, and he was responsible for the death of many Jewish people and also for the death of 500 Polish people in the region. She did not know that she adored her grandfather. She loved fishing and hunting and spending time with him. And it was only when she was in her 40s that she learned the truth about her grandfather and then set out to research his life almost to prove to herself that what she had heard was not true. Um, and she wrote her book. But this is, her book opens where she describes two dreams. In one dream, she's she is being um, pursued. And in this dream, she's a murderer. And I'm, I'm just going to read it for you because it's a very good example of haunt memory. I'm a murderer. It's not clear who my victim was. It's also not clear that there is just one. I've buried whoever I've killed. I had help. There was planning involved in the placement of graves. Often my dead are buried near a construction site, a place where concrete will be poured, where floors will be laid, where dogs, Lassie and Rin Tin Tin, oh, sorry, that's spell check. Um, because again, this dream began in childhood, will sniff and paw at the ground, at the just laid turf, at the stone steps, and the hedge of fresh ground around the foundation. 
the dogs alert only to the ordinary, okay, and so on and so forth. So basically, she um, is having this dream where she feels that she has committed a murder um, and that she is about to get caught. And this dream repeats and repeats, repeats throughout her lifetime. Okay, next slide, please. All right. So in the post-war era, in the Cold War era, many Lithuanian DPs recognized from trauma that was not rec uh, recognized and survivor's guilt was definitely present. Um, and many had family members who had been killed or sent to si Siberia. So this unresolved trauma is passed on to subsequent generations and hence you have haunt memory that's explored in the memoirs. All right, next slide, please. All right, I'm just going to wrap up by just quickly talking about trauma theory. It's um, a literary theory that's preoccupied with the systems and effects of trauma as expressed in a written text. And um, so trauma theory uses the tools of psychoanalytical criticism and the discipline of psychology and the humanities, sociology to um, analyze a literary text. And next slide. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to finish with this image. This is a painting by Samuel Bach. Uh, it's called Targeted, and he um, painted this image over and over and over again, many, many, many times, dozens of times. And uh, this is an image that's based on the famous photograph of the Warsaw boy, with, which is a young boy with his arms up. And Samuel Bach looks at that photo and he thinks, well, that could have been me. That was exactly my age. But he also thinks about his friend um, and namesake, a friend who had the same name as him, Samuel, who was actually killed as a child in the Holocaust. And, um, and he's really haunted by the sense that he survived and his, his best friend, Sam, did not survive. And he obsessively paints um, this painting. He writes about this in his memoir um, until he realizes that what he can do for his friend Sam is to continue living for him, to live not just his own life, but to live for his friend as well in memory of his friend. Um, so I'm just going to end by saying that one thing that a theme that comes up in the book is that um, many of the writers talk about how through the process of writing or for Samuel Bach painting, they're able to work through um, post-memory and trauma, inherited trauma, and um, really come to this place of catharsis, which would be called post-traumatic growth, which is you, you work through these very difficult um, topics and you come to this point where it is um, positive. It's a positive where this the trauma energizes you to um, really do a lot of good work for the community. And certainly we see that with Samuel Bach creating the um, Samuel Bach Museum in Vilnius. We see expressions of post-traumatic growth that have its roots um, in um, the displaced persons camps of the post-war era with the Lithuanian system of Lithuanian Saturday schools, summer camps, organizations like Adetininke, Scouts, the list goes on and on and on. There's been such more than half a century of a very rich cultural Lithuanian American, Lithuanian Canadian life that we've all experienced and enjoyed and benefited from which one could argue is an expression of post-traumatic growth. Okay, so I'm just, there's just going to end, well, you could read the conclusion yourself that there's a sense of belatedness in the trauma, um, in the memoirs, because everything was frozen in time by this 50-year occupation of Lithuania where families were, were separated due to, to totalitarianism. These stories could not be expressed. They could not be told. They could not be written about. Um, final slide. And um, yeah, so I just want to end by saying these memoirs do not function only as literary works, but they become through their narrative intent, artifacts for future healing, 
offering the possibility of repair between Christian Lithuanians and Jews and between members of the second and third generations of the North American Lithuanian diaspora and their contemporaries in Lithuania. So I'm just going to end here and open up the discussion for, for questions. And I'm going to grab a glass of water while we're making that transition. Okay. <laughs> Ačiū laimai. Dabar bus proga jums atsakyti, bus proga jai atsakyti į jūsų klausimus. Iki šiol esam gavę vieną klausimą. Dabar yra proga ir kitiems pateikti klausimus man per chat. So far we've received one question on chat and I invite those of you who have questions for Laima to address them to me. So the first question is, do you believe uh, Yulia Shukis's family's exile to Siberia, um, the reasons for them, if I'm understanding correctly, are representative of most of uh, Lithuanians' deportation to Siberia? In other words, the reasons for her family's exile, uh, do you think that they're the same as the reasons for other Lithuanians' deportation to Siberia? Okay, well, first of all, um, in her book, her, her, her grandmother is exiled um, in 1941 in the first, the first round of arrests and exile. And um, her grandfather starts working with, as a German police officer during the Nazi occupation of Lithuania after that exile. Okay, so... Um, so there's no, she was not exiled because of her husband's activities during the, the Nazi occupation of Lithuania. She was exiled previously. The people who were exiled were um, intellectuals, they were teachers, professors, um, uh, government workers, diplomats, artists, writers. I mean, it was really a plan you know, the, the Stalinist plan was to really cut off the head of, of the nation to um, to destroy the, the elites. They also exiled um, farmers who, who owned a lot of land, who were successful farmers. And I also have to say that both Lithuanian Jews and um, Lithuanian Christians were equally exiled to Siberia in 1941. I can't remember the percentage now. Um, uh, the historian Violeta da Voluta has done research about this, but there are numbers of exactly how many Jewish Lithuanians were exiled as part of the intellectual class in 1941. So, um, you know, it's very hard to say that one person's family member was exiled for the same reason as so many others because they were you know they were all individual cases but we do know that people that people were the people who were exiled were innocent they had not committed crimes when they were deported to to Siberia uh Achu. uh the next question um what questions would you give about reigniting PTSD when interviewing survivors? Okay, what suggestions would I give? What cautions? Uh, what cautions? Oh, what would cautions? You what give cautions? About reigniting PTSD. Yeah, you know, um, if we go back to a book that I wrote about fifteen years ago called "Journey into the Backwaters of the Heart," and it's published in in Lithuanian as "Musu um, Nepalavja." And uh, that book is really huh, the result of um, during my, my Fulbright, my second Fulbright in Lithuania, where I spent four years interviewing predominantly women, my focus was on women, um, who fought in the anti-Soviet armed resistance, okay? And these women, they were fighters or they were um, liaisons between between different um, partisan groups. And they, 
usually were about, you know, ages from 17 till about 25 years old when they joined the resistance. And the only ones who I was able to interview are the ones who survived, but survival meant that they had been arrested, they had been tortured, they had been interrogated, and they had been deported to um, hard labor camps in Siberia. So these are people who had experienced extreme trauma. And um, I always asked people to tell me about their childhood first. I mean, I would always open up our discussion by, I would tell them what I was doing, what my intention was. And I would say, tell me about your childhood. And um, and we would talk about childhood. And actually, their childhoods re revealed a lot about their choices to join the resistance. And um, as we built up trust, we could ease our way into the really difficult um, subjects. But they knew that these things had to be talked about, that they had to be written about, that there had to be a record left behind. All of these people have passed away now. Um, because otherwise that history would have been lost. And um, and so it was difficult for them to share these stories, but they did it. And um, so I took as much time as it took. I mean, I would maybe sometimes I would stay with people for several days um, to get their story. I was always an empathetic listener. So if you listen with empathy, um, that's a process of healing for people who have experienced extreme trauma to be able to share their story and to have um, someone listen with empathy, uh, that's that's really helpful for them. And, you know, the, the psychologist Dori Laub has written a lot about that, about um, working with Holocaust survivors and um, the benefits of listening with, with empathy. So the cautions that I would give is that you have to go into this with a pure heart and, and really be ready to hear these stories and be ready to hug somebody when they need a hug or to just sit quietly when someone needs to cry or, um, you know, and to just be, to be present. It's really not, it's not easy to do, um, but sometimes, but we need to we need to write down these stories and we need to hold on to them, because people sacrificed a lot so that Lithuania and Latvia, Estonia could be free, right now, and we need to remember those sacrifices. Uh, next question: Are there any marked differences between the post memory works written by ethnic Lithuanians and Lithuanian Jews slash Litvox? Um, well, I think the only difference is, is like the, the differences of the emphasis of where the subject matter is, but it's, it's so hard to really give any kind of, um, concrete answer to that because every book <coughs> is so different, but in now take a writer like, um, Rita Gabis, for example, who her father was, um, Jewish, he came from a, a Ukrainian Jewish family and her mother was a Lithuanian DP. So she had um, post memory and um, on both sides of the family, she had uh, historical traumas passed down on both sides of the family and she writes about both sides of those families. So it's not, you know, a lot of times there's much more interrelatedness than we would think at first, okay? Because I think that we like to put things into very neat categories, but it's, that's not how life works. So um, I can't say that there would be marked differences, except that there were the circumstances, the situations were, were different. What are your thoughts on how to share the story of Lithuania and Lithuanians with new generations? How can memories be enlisted for young people to help prevent the dark history from repeating? Mm. Do you know, I think that's a very important observation. It's really important. And I want to share a moment where um, I really felt that the work that I was doing was was important and that it can make a difference. 
um, I gave a talk about vanished lands at um, the university where I teach, University of Southern Maine in Portland, Maine. And um, after the talk, I mean, people that uh, Franco, people of Franco-American descent, of um, Irish descent, so many different different nationalities who've also experienced collective historical trauma. <clears throat> Iranian people were in the audience, really shared about their experiences, and they found these links and commonalities. And uh, after the talk, a colleague of mine, who is Russian and grew up in Siberia, and uh, later as an adult, he emigrated to London and then to the United States, and he taught teaches in the in the education department at our university. And he said to me. He said a couple of things that that were that really stayed with me. He said, um, "He said my children are growing up in the United States, but if they told me they were going on to on a right of return journey to Russia, I would be horrified and I would try to stop them." But the other thing that he said was much more profound. <clears throat> that he said, "He said what I admire about Lithuanians and what I what really struck me." with your book is that you are able to talk about um, very difficult moments in your country's past where Lithuanians were the perpetrators, um, that these Lithuanian writers in your book are able to talk about um, Lithuanian collaborators with during the German occupation and that um, they talk about difficult difficult, hor horrific truths with openness and honesty. And he said, I feel that that is why Lithuania is a democratic country today, is because the the writers and um, intellectuals guide people to face difficult parts of the history and to work through it. And that way the nation can grow. And he said, by contrast, he said, in my country where I grew up, he said in Russia, um, culturally, people will never admit difficult historical truths where Russians were the perpetrators. We are always the victims and the heroes. And he says, and that is why we cannot grow as a nation, as a culture, as a society. And I was, I was just very, very moved by that. Um, that he really um, felt that the only way <clears throat> that any nation can grow is by facing the most difficult truths and talking about them and sharing those stories and telling those stories. And, um, and he really cited what's happening now in Russia as an example of what happens when a nation refuses to go through this process, or doesn't he even understand that it should be going through this process? There's a question we received earlier that may connect uh, relate to what you just said. Uh, one um, participant asked, in your conclusion, you state that there are, quote, family secrets and silence, unquote. What do you mean by that? Well, it's part of, part of trauma. Um, is either families talked a lot about it or they didn't talk about it at all. And one thing that came up with interviewing the writers in the book or um, reading their work was the instances of where um, the second generation could sense that something terrible had happened, but nobody was talking about it. And that... Um, sense of knowing but not knowing um, actually produces um, anxiety and trauma in, in, in family members. So not talking about a traumatic event or hiding a traumatic event um, can be as damaging as um, talking about it too much, if that, if that makes any sense, that silence is a form of trauma, the inability to express um, what you have experienced is also um, an expression of trauma. 
Have you had the opportunity to speak with any of these authors about what is happening in Ukraine and is that making the PTSD worse? Um, I actually defended my doctoral dissertation um, the uh, two days into the um, the the Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine, of um, complete invasion of Ukraine, and that was that was really tough because um, in that moment, the last thing that me or anybody wanted to think about was <laughs> defending a dissertation. There were other things that needed to be done, like preparing to help Ukraine in any way possible, um, thinking about donating supplies, helping helping refugees. And um, what happened in those early weeks of the invasion in Lithuania was that for a lot of people, um, PTSD was triggered. And um, Samuel Bach, who's become a close friend since I first interviewed him um, for this book, he had told me, you know, he had said, call me after you defend your dissertation. I want to hear about it. So that evening, it was, you know, literally, it was like, okay, so the invasion was February 22nd. This, I think this is like February 24th. And I called him and he said to me, he said, I'm watching television right now. And he said, I cannot believe that what I experienced as a child is happening again that this is happening again how can this how can this be and um and it was really you know it's 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 quite horrific and overwhelming you know and it does it does re-trigger a lot of um a lot of these you know very very difficult emotions for people and um and again i think about what my um colleague who grew up in um and Siberia told me was that it's very important, as difficult and as messy as the process is, it's really important for um, a nation to face those moments in history when your nation is, um, is a perpetrator or collaborates with a perpetrator and to face that and to see that. Because if you don't, if you keep creating myths and fantasies, it's just going to lead um, deeper and deeper into um, this cycle of of violence. Have you collected um, uh, stories um, and uh, traumas of Lithuanians who remained in the Klaipeda region after the March 1939 Anschluss to Nazi Germany? Yeah, you know what? Um, I I haven't. I think I I I have collected some stories of um, Lithuanians of, with ethnic German heritage who were um, arrested and um, deported to hard labor in Tajikistan. And those stories <clears throat> are in my book, Musu Nepalausia, or Journey into the Backwaters of the Heart. So there are, um, in fact, one of those stories is by, um, was told to me by a woman who had um, a Jewish father and a German mother. And um, she experienced both horrors as a child. She was um, incarcerated in the Kolnas ghetto. She, they managed to escape. And this just, as soon as they escaped, escaped, they were arrested as Germans. And she and her mother were deported to Tajikistan. Her father was killed in the Holocaust. Um, but in specifically Klaipeda region, no, I... I wish I had, and the thing is, is like that generation is has passed away, and so it's it's you know it's a bit late now. Now we can only hear the stories from the subsequent generations. But I do have to say that as a teenager, I was a student at the Lithuanian high school in Germany, and um, now I've been back to Germany um, twice, staying for a longer period of time. And now when I meet up with my former classmates and we talk, now they're able to talk about how they had parents who were what would have been called Vilkovike, which they were parents who were ethnic Germans in Lithuania who um, were orphaned or, or, or suffered during 
um, during the Soviet occupation of the Klaipeda region, and they're able to tell me about that. Um, but those people have passed away already. So I wish I I wish I had I um, I think, you know I, I I think archives are important. The work of historians is, is extremely important. But personally, um, I like to collect people's stories. I think that people's personal experiences, their oral histories, can um, kind of bring history alive. Perhaps, you know, I think. Maybe we need to meld those two things. You know, we have the the archives, we have the historical facts, but then we also have people's memories and 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 um, reminiscences. So I wish I could have done it all, but unfortunately, I haven't. Okay, uh, this is um, uh, more in the realm of uh, comment rather than question. Um, one individual says, on a positive note. Latuve should be very proud of their accomplishments during the, quote, post-traumatic growth period. There will never be a generation like the Dipukai. Do you know what? I agree. The more I learn and the more I reflect, the more I appreciate that generation. I mean, I, I grew up with that generation surrounding me and going to the summer camps and schools and activities organized by them. But only now do I realize what a gift they passed on. And, um, and I think about, you know, people who um, took an interest in me when I was, you know, like a teenager writing poetry for my very first poems or, you know, interested in literature, who took an interest in me and encouraged me. And, um, you know, I don't know, you know, if if that happens so much anymore. I, I see them as a very positive force in my life. They were a very positive and supportive force. Um, if I may, I'm going to ask a question um, of my own. Um, during your presentation, you uh, said that the authors who you analyze through the process of doing research and writing uh, reached uh, personal catharsis and post-traumatic growth. And um, in reading your book, I wonder, well, what about the rest of us who aren't writers? And <laughs> you, you, sort of, you sort of answered that in, by saying that the collective um, um, memory that the uh, DP generation inculcated in their children and grandchildren here led to post-traumatic um, uh, growth and catharsis. But I guess my question then would be, are the writers doubly blessed because they grew up in this community that in theory provided them with personal growth? Um, and they also were able to write about it. Um, and then second question, is there any kind of um, contradiction here be in the sense that people like Shideika and, and, and Marquedas talk about being pushed and pulled in two directions, right? And you even cited yeah. Shideika about how he wished he, wished he could uh, live in his own memory instead of living his parents' memory. So is it fair to say it's a blessing and a curse to, to grow up in a community like that? Oh. Yeah, curse is a strong word, but um, it's it's it, again it's and it's not so simple for all these writers. It's complex. Like for Samuel Bach, who one thing that I found analyzing his memoir was that he suffered from so much survivor's guilt throughout his life. Um, but he, you know, through painting, through writing, he's actually, he's written more books than just painted in words. He writes a lot about his paintings, that he works through these difficult emotions through writing. But he also has done very concrete things to help um, future generations in Lithuania. He actually donated, I think it's about 500 of his best paintings to... Um, the Samuel Bach Museum in Vilnius, you know, and helped create that museum. So people can go and see that work. And and he's also, even though he's 91 years old, anytime in the museum in Vilnius asks him 
to participate in a Zoom event, he does. And one of the projects that they've been doing is bringing in um, Ukrainian refugees and refugee children to look at his artwork because it's a cathartic moment for them. They can connect with it. And, um, and he does a lot of talks. So here's somebody who had this very painful experience um, of living through the Holocaust, losing his family, and was already, you know, into his middle age when he comes back to Lithuania for the first time, um, becomes very close friends with um, the writer, historian, former parliamentarian, Rimanta Stankavichus, who he calls his brother, you know, a very, very close friendship, and really does so much good. So there's, you know, there's an example of post-traumatic growth. I think when I think about Rita Gabis, like her book ends in an enigmatic way. She could really see that she's still grappling, still struggling with a lot of the themes in the book. So um, I don't, I think that everybody can write about what they're feeling and expressing. You don't need to be a published author to have that sense of catharsis through writing. I mean, you can, you know, journal just privately, write about your own memories of um, growing up in the Lithuanian diaspora or your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own family stories. And through that process, um, have those same experiences of, of catharsis and post-traumatic growth. It doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be um, a working writer who's publishing um, to have that experience. And the same with, with art, the same with, with music. So I think that when it comes to cultural memory, that there was the DP generation had a mission to <coughs> pass down Lithuanian cultural memory as they experienced it as young people during the first um, Lithuanian independence. And actually, many people from that older generation who I've um, interviewed and spoken to would talk about how their parents was, they were, like, I guess it would be like my great grandparents. They were the generation who um, were rebuilding Lithuania from nothing after 1918. And they were very patriotic and instilled this love of country. The school system was very strong then. And the DPs, they were, they brought all of that with them. And they create they constructed cultural memory through stories, through songs, through rituals, through holidays, through shared events. And that's something they passed on. Now, I'm an East Coast Lithuanian, so there's nothing more fun on the East Coast than to go to Camp Neringa and cook with a bunch of people and, you know, and enjoy a holiday together out in the in the camp setting to sit around the fireplace in the evening and and discuss. And so, yes, those are all expressions of um, shared collective memory and they are and they are positive. But I don't think that writers, professional writers or artists are blessed in a special way above and beyond everybody else, because we all can use the tool of writing to work our way through a lot of difficult um, emotions and, and thoughts and, and feelings. Thank you. Um, <coughs> this is the follow <clears throat> Yeah. This is the follow up to um, the person who asked the question about uh, the traumas of those who remained in the Klaipeda region after the um, Nazi Anschluss. Um, uh, the person who wrote this said, Lima is a survivor of that region and still here. I have written several vignettes of that time. Are you interested in reading them? Yeah. Yeah, well, send them to me. <laughs> I will read them. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, well uh, make sure the two of you connect later on. So. Yeah. Um. As you have described, we as children of DPs have been exposed to trauma by our parents' experiences. Is there research on what happens to these children in terms of their success in academics and jobs? achieved social class, their psychological health, et cetera. Any research that is not just anecdotal or case studies? She's looking for, are there, is there any statistical research? Yeah, I, I really wish there was. I really wish wish there was. 
Um, but I mean, you could take a look at the work of Danuta Gailiana, but she's not really studying um, DPs. She did studies on the children and grandchildren of um, deportees to Siberia. And um, she, as a, a clinical <clears throat> psychiatrist, she worked um, with, you know, she worked in a very methodical um, way. In fact, her book is called Kaya Mumspadare, and uh, you can find her, her research in that book. Um, and I'm trying to think, I think that, uh, again, this is, Also, you would say case studies and anecdotal, but I would recommend watching the film The Paradox of Seabrook Farms, very powerful documentary film by Helga Meritz, and it is about the Estonian and Latvian community. So Lithuanians actually were a little more fortunate after World War II because there was an, a, an established Um, first wave of Lithuanian immigrants who had churches and homes and businesses, and they could sponsor Lithuanians to come over and build a new life in the United States. But Latvians and Estonians did not quite have that network in the United States. So actually, many of them ended up um, working on, on farms for, you know, substandard wages. So um, Seabrook Farms was a farm in New Jersey that had a long history of exploiting farm workers, of underpaying farm workers. So after the war, they took workers from three vulnerable populations, displaced persons, um, Japanese Americans who had been put in internment camps and had lost everything, and uh, African Americans who were leaving the South trying to get away from the, the Jim Crow laws. And they brought these three groups together and um, housed them in substandard barracks. And they worked very long hours um, on the farm and were paid very little money. But what the film documents is that the three communities pulled together and that they placed all their energy and emphasis on education for their children and on honoring their cultural heritage. And um, they became a very strong community And there's a very high success rate of the second generation who um, either came to the Seabrook Farm as children or were, were born there, who really went on to have very strong professional careers. So in that film, um, the filmmaker interviews people of African-American descent, Japanese-American, Estonian, and Latvian, and really um, talks about the post-traumatic growth that people who had suffered so much, how they were able through education and culture and community to um, really provide a very good life and a good future for their children. But in terms of research, really the only thing I could suggest is the work of Danuta Gailiana, um, if you can read Lithuanian. And, um, and I'd like to invite some uh, somebody in the field of psychology to take that on. Um, mes einam prie pabaigos, um, uh, so, um, jeigu jūs turite dar kokį vieną kitą klausimą, prašau dabar įrašyti, uh, tuo tarpu, um, aš noriu uh, dar vieną klausimą pateikti. Jūs be abejo uh, ruoždama knygą įsigilinote į, labai įsigilinote į kultūrinės ir kolektyvinės atminties mokslinę teoriją ir Uh, savo pristatyme jūs uh, kalbėjote apie tai, kad, kad paprastai tęsiasi um, į antrą ir trečią kartą ir po to pasibaigė, bet man klausimas yra, ar mokslininkai yra radę, kad iš šimties atvejais tęsiasi daugiau negu tris kartas? Aš turiu omeny, jeigu yra pavyzdžiui dėl uh, holokosto, ar jeigu buvo lietuviai, kurie, kurių um, tėvas ar močiutė buvo uh, nužudyti Lietuvoj sovietų, ar, 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 um, ar ištremti Siberą ir, ir dingo Siberę, tai būtų labai sunkių traumą ir vieniems ir kitiems. Ar tas maždaug baigėsi su jų anūkais, ar, ar gali tęstis dar toliau? 
Okay, that's a really interesting question. And um, there, you know, I'm not going to pull up the name right now. I have to go back and look in my book, but there is a psychologist <coughs> who did look at um, what happens to subsequent generations. And the paradox is that you would think that trauma inheritance um, with each generation would become weaker, weaker, and fade away to nothing. But actually, the this what this researcher argues is that um, post memory and um, intergenerational trauma becomes stronger in the third generation. Okay, and he was looking at Holocaust, the Holocaust legacy. We don't quite know about the fourth generation yet, but the the reason for that is that. Um, you know, it has to do with with exile. Okay, so that when, with when you talk about the Holocaust or you talk about, um, you know, Baltic people fleeing Siberian exile, now you have another generation that comes of age in a completely different culture, educated in a different language. So this this cultural disconnect happens, right? But the generation that's that's born to the first generation who experienced the um, collective trauma. Um, they hear the stories. They they see their their the pain, um, and they have a sense of what's going on. But the next generation, they know that something terrible happened, but they might not know exactly what. They might not really be. They might not understand the language. They might not have that connection. And so that's where the imagination comes into play and um and the anxiety becomes even bigger. Okay, does that make does that make sense? So it's like this one there was one researcher who's written about that, how with each subsequent generation the anxiety um around the trauma then grows be, from that sense of knowing something happened, but I don't know what, I don't understand it, but it was terrible. So, you know, I, I mean, humans, we as humans are, we're almost programmed to create narratives, all right? When we don't have an answer for something, we create a story. It's just, we will take a few fragmented events and piece them together and create a story. We're storytellers, we're natural storytellers. And um, so what happens with with these collective trauma events is that, if you're a descendant of a person who's experienced um, a collective trauma or an extreme trauma, if you know little pieces of it, you're going to weave a narrative. And that, and when you start weaving those narratives, that's sometimes where uh, that narrative can get the better of you. It could become a preoccupation. Achu, achu, ush labai idomis discussias ir ush labai idomis klausimus. Laikas skirtas discussiams jau baigėsi. Nuo širdžiai dėkoju mūsų prelegentai už jos išvalgas apie išėvijos Lietuvių patirtas traumas ir jų pastangas perduoti kolektyvinę kultūrinę atmintį. Aš manau, kad sutiksim, kad jos analizė mūsų skatina giliau apmastyti savo praeitį. Dėkoju Šiaurės Amerikos ateitininkų tarybos nariams, kurie padėjo organizuoti šį renginį, Aivainis Aleksą, Indrė Čiuplinskaitė, Rima Idzelytė Brandas, Audra Kubidutė Daulienė ir Grasilda Reinytė Petkus. Taip pat už techninę pagalbą dėkojame Šiaurės Šiaurės Amerikos ateitininkų tarybos pirmininkui darė Polikaičiai. Pabaigai kviečiu virtualių renginių darbo grupės pirmininkę daktarę Indrę Čiuplinskaitę tarti žodį. Labas, labai džiaugiamės tikrai laimą tavo pristatymu ir kad taip gausiai susirinkome pasiklausyti šitų minčių, man atrodo, mes visi randame save, tuome, ką pristatėjai. Tik norėjau pasakyti, kad pūnau jų metų įvyks dar du renginiai, tai tikimės apie sausio mėnesio renginio detalės netrukus, mes tikimės jas paskelbti. Ir taip pat, jeigu norite paremti Šiaurės Amerikos ateitinkų tarybos virtualius renginius, 
kviečiame paukoti šiai iniciatyvai per šat internetinė svetainė ateitis.org. Tai dar sveiki, ačiū labai ir iki sekančio virtualaus renginio. Su Dievu. Ačiū, ačiū Jums visiems, kad klausėt, kad susirinkot ir jo, labai sunkios temos, bet reikia apie jas kalbėti. Labai ačiū. Ačiū. Ačiū Laima, ačiū Viktorai, ačiū Indrė.